Most of you know that Hebrews 11 is that great faith chapter. We're going to be talking about visible faith today. Beginning in verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In other words, faith is our substance, and it's based on truth. A lot of people's faith is not based on truth. We'll talk about that. For by it, people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible in number six. And without faith, it is impossible. Notice that word impossible. It is impossible to please Him or God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. See, His reward is based not on our knowledge because He knows not only what we do and why we do it, he knows the motive and everything. And I'm so glad my reward is not based on what men say, Amen. but on what Amen. he says. Father, help us to understand visible faith. In Jesus' name, amen. You have in your bulletin a sheet that can, you can jot down some notes if you desire to do so. And hopefully you will. I'm going to be sharing a number of scriptures so you can write down the name of the scriptures on your, on your pack or whatever you have there. In Mark chapter 2, you remember the story when they, four men took their paralytic friend and brought him to Jesus and they couldn't get in the door because the crowd was so big and went up on the roof, cut a hole in the roof. Can you imagine the owner of the house said, hey, what are you doing to my roof? But they go up to the roof, cut a hole, and they lower Jesus. I mean, the paralytic down to Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus looked up and saw their faith. And I've been mulling that statement around for a couple of weeks now, saw their faith. We know that faith is actually the key to the relationship of grace from our part. Because unless we trust Him, we cannot receive His grace. Same true in any relationship, as I've said last week or two weeks ago. But just how does one see faith? We sang about it today. Thanks for those songs. I want to try to unpack that. First of all, I want to talk about misunderstanding about faith. I've said for many, many years as a pastor that I think one of the most misunderstood things in the Christian life is this whole matter of faith. Now there's some basic facts that we know about faith. We know that in the Greek language, the word believe and the word faith are the exact same Greek word. One is a verb, believe. The other is a noun, faith. And there are some exceptions, but generally that's how they're interpreted, so forth. Um, but people often misuse or misunderstand them. For, pe for example, people say, you just got to believe. Without ever saying, what? <laughs> you know, you remember the New York Mets way back? That was their theme when their team came from way behind to win the World Series. You just got to believe. I don't know what would have happened had they lost. But <laughs> um, we hear often what is, so, what is so important being said today is you got to believe in yourself. Ever heard that? You hear it all the time. You just got to believe in yourself. I don't think we sang about that today. 
<laughs> With faith, people say, what faith are you? Like it's a denomination. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Amen. Amen. Okay? So it is not that. Uh, many have what I call faith in faith. And what I mean by that is if you just make yourself believe hard enough, it's going to happen like the ant with the rubber tree plant. plant. <laughs> just believe hard enough and it'll happen. Or they pray to have more faith. When Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard, said you can move a mountain. Now, does faith need to increase? Sure. But I need to use the faith that I have. The issue in all of this is that the misunderstanding that most have about belief and faith is that it's intellectual. That it's in our mind. It's in our mind. One of the songs that we sang said it doesn't, you know, but that's what a lot of people believe. And, and, and it is absolutely vital. Please hear this. Don't miss what I'm going to say now. It is absolutely vital that you believe the truth that we sang about that's in the scripture. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on a cross, that he rose again from the dead. If you don't believe that, forget all the rest of that faith. That's foundational. That is absolutely foundational. But if it just stays in our heads and is not evidenced in our lives, we misunderstand. Some think that uh, Paul and James were at odds with each other. For the Apostle Paul says, we are saved by grace through faith and not of works, as any man should boast. Right? And James says in chapter 2, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. And then he says this very interesting phrase. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe that. Now, if all you believe is that, Hey, the devil believes that, and he's even scared of it because he knows the truth of what's going to happen to him. You see that when he casts out demons and, and, and so forth. James is not in conflict with what Paul said. He's saying that faith that Paul talked about, if it's real, there's got to be evidence of it in our lives. If it's not evidenced in our lives, then it's not real saving faith. You understand Shake your head or something, or you're still not okay. We're talking about that. Okay. The source of biblical faith is a trustworthy God, and God has proved Himself over and over again to be trustworthy. How many of you have ever been hurt by someone you trusted and found out they weren't trustworthy? Most everybody has, right? At some point. We look at politicians, but we look at just personal relationships and everything like that. So, with that little bit of background, how does this work in our lives? And I'm going to share some things that's going to mess you up a little bit with your thinking, because you haven't thought like this before. In my own life, first of all, I like to use the word trust. I think that's more understood. I believe this would hold me up if I sat on it, but it's not holding me up. Why? And I had all the evidence in the world that it would. Right? Matter of fact, I did a sermon one time. I had two chairs. One that said faith, the other said truth. And when I sat on the one that said faith, it collapsed. <laughs> I mean, on purpose. And then the other was truth. It's, it's got to be, it's got to be true. The word trust in the New Testament is a different Greek word, but it's similar and it's basically, it's translated as trust, hope, confidence, and rest. We could go last Friday, we played golf, and it was absolutely so hot. I got home, I was exhausted. And I went to bed at 9 o'clock, and I didn't wake up to 8 o'clock the next morning. And that never happens for me. But just laying there and go, Whoa. you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You've been there, done that, right? Rest. Last week we talked about Steve McVeigh. Remember I told you his story. 
of grace and everything. He, he wrote a book entitled The Secret of Grace. So the first chapter is entitled The Secret of Not Trying. I like that for a chapter title. The Secret of Not Trying. I want to share some thoughts from that and, and then share some scripture things. I want you to use your imagination for just a minute. Imagine, and I, I know this would be difficult, but imagine Jesus physically when he was alive here on earth. Waking up one morning. Maybe he was at Lazarus and Mary Martha's place and she was fixing breakfast and he... Imagine him waking up and saying, hmm, I wonder what I should do for Father today. Uh, I know. Maybe I'll heal somebody. He likes that. Uh, maybe I'll find some people to teach. He really likes want to do that. Oh, I know. I know. Well, I'll find a funeral procession. I'll raise somebody from the dead. Father really likes that. If you think that's the way it was, you better listen to the rest of this message. Because <laughs> that wasn't the way it was. But this is how so many of us try to live our lives. But listen to the book of Acts. In chapter 17. Remember Paul had gone to Athens. Listen carefully to these words. Acts 17 beginning in verse 22. You want to write it down someplace and look it up right over here. So Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus said. Men of Athens I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found an also an altar with this inscription, inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor, listen, is he served by human <coughs> hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Are you ready for this astounding statement? Are you ready? Listen. God doesn't need you. Amen. And He doesn't need me. He doesn't need us. Think about all of your assets and all of your abilities and put that next to this omnipotent God who stood on nothing and said, let there be, and there was. You really think that He needs you? And that may trouble you some, but I have really good news for you. He may not need you, but He wants you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. He wants you. That's what John 17 is all about in Jesus' prayer. Oh, Father, I want them to know the relationship that we have, which is eternal life. I've seen it over the years. When I've done any marriage counseling, a lot of times, it's kind of like this. The couple comes in, and the wife says, you know, my husband works a lot, and he provides food, and he provides funds, and he provides all that. And I kind of like his secretary and do all this stuff for him. But it's almost like he doesn't need me. I, I, I'm happy that he's providing for us, but I want him do you understand what I'm saying? Say, do you understand what I'm saying? You, you get the idea. You understand. Okay. Okay. Same thing is true with God. If we think the relationship we have with God is based on what we do for Him, that misunderstands the relationship. And if we think that, we will never know intimacy into me, see? Intimacy? We'll never know intimacy with Him because we think He's only interested in what we do for Him and not in Him. You got that? That's pretty deep stuff, but you need to hear it. If it is about what we do for Him, we will see Him as our divine employer who scrutinizes everything we do. Does this mean that we should be passive about our activity? Absolutely not. 
But it means that first and foremost, it means that we are to focus on Him with a full confidence, trust, rest, and hope that our actions will be the natural flow of a love relationship with Him. It's not what we do so He will love us. It's what we do because He does. And because we trust Him. When we become obsessed with Him and our lifestyles become energized by His divine life. Let me blow you away again. Jesus never tried to do one thing for His Father. Are you surprised? Write some of these scriptures down. John 5, 19. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something you, He can see, unless it is something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son does likewise. Jesus asserted that his behavior didn't flow from his own self-efforts. He did nothing independent of God. Did you hear that? Jesus Christ did not do anything. He did nothing independent of God. Listen again to his own words, John 5.30. I can do nothing on my own initiative. John 7.16. My teaching is not mine, but Him who sent me. John 8, 28. I do nothing by my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father has taught me. 8, 42. I have not even come on my own initiative. I didn't even come to die on the cross on my own initiative. The Father sent me. And then 12, 49. I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father Himself gave me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. Do you get the picture? Jesus was here. And he lived as a normal man, just like us human beings. Ephesians 2 makes it clear. He did not count his godness as something to be held onto. And even though while he was on earth, he was fully God, he did not hold on to that. He was still that, but he did not hold on to it. But rather rested in his father and took upon himself the form of a servant. He became fully man. He was totally helpless apart from the divine enablement of his father. You ever thought about that? Yes? No? He is totally helpless apart from the enablement of his So if Jesus had to live in total dependence on His Father, do you think we can do it without that? Do you think that? Jesus made it so clear. Listen to John 15. I'm the vine. You are the branches. As the branch is connected to the vine, it, bear, it doesn't produce any fruit. It simply bears fruit that the vine does. Have you ever watched a, have you ever gone to a vineyard? You ever submitted to a vineyard? Have you ever seen a, a grape branch stretching and trying, and trying to have a grape <laughs> You stay connected as long as there's a vital connection between the vine and the branch. And Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can do whatever you will. For without me you can do what? Nothing. 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 What does nothing mean? Nothing. 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 <laughs> no thing. <laughs> nothing I can do. <laughs> so he is saying, stop Trying to do things for God. Focus on the fact that you're in Christ. Ephesians. Let me get over here to the right place. In Ephesians chapter 1. Listen to these verses. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us in Christ. 
with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He has predestined us for the adoption of sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ. As a plan of fullness of time, He had all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, and so forth and so forth. In Him, in Him, in Him. You know, we talk so much about, and I hear people say, and, and some kids question this too, you know, Jesus is living in me. And I hear kids say, how did He get in there? <laughs> and it was like, kid, his mom says she's pregnant. He says, what, did you eat him? How did you, <laughs> how did He get in there? But we are in Christ. That's a huge thing. And you say, and some people say whenever you talk about grace, well, what about the commands in the Bible? What about that? What about that? Aren't we supposed to do that for Him? What about, why don't we bring back the Ten Commandments? Really? Anybody stand up here today and name all ten of them? Anybody? You can name all ten commandments. Okay, praise the Lord, that's great. But you know what Jesus did? He took those ten commandments and all the rest and he summed them up in two. And if you do these two things, you will have fulfilled it all. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. If you do that, all the others will be taken care of. It's, it's about the relationship. You understand? <laughs> what about obedience? <clears throat> Please listen. Obedience happens when we trust Jesus within us and who we are in to fulfill the desires of the Father through us. As He does that, we will fulfill the commands of Scripture. I'm supposed to love. How do I do that? As I experience, we love because He first loved us. Right? Amen. And, and go through it. What about tithing? What about tithing? Mm. Well, that's never been a question. I mean, I, I don't lay awake and say, I wonder if I should tithe or not. You know, these, these are just normal stuff that you do. Forgiveness. What about forgiveness? All those things we know that are in the Scripture. Only one person has ever lived a Christian life. And that's Jesus. Jesus. And he says in Romans chapter 8, listen to this. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are, there it is again, in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. In order that, listen, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh. We talked about the flesh last week. But according to the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is living inside of us. To help us to become what we can. To know what to do. Of course we read scripture. That's one of the vital things that we do. Not, not, not simply as a command. Not simply as a command. I remember back in my early days. You all remember back when you had to check off what you did during the week? Daily Bible reading. Just out of curiosity, am I the only one? Did you ever check off daily Bible readings and you hadn't done it? Because you didn't want to look bad when you turned your sheet in? Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. And see, with all of that said, with all that said, out of the flow of Jesus' life in me now, so I read the scripture and I look for Jesus. Remember the Pharisees, they knew the scriptures. They memorized the scriptures. They memorized the whole Old Testament. And yet when Jesus came, they missed him. 
Jesus said, you study the scriptures because you think and then they have life, but there they which point to me and you would not come to me. I'm telling you this. If you read the Bible every day and you feel really proud of yourself because you're reading the Bible, if you miss Jesus in all of that, even in the Old Testament, then you miss the whole point. This is his love letter to us. Well, did you all, before you got married, you ever write love letters back to one another? Hmm? She wrote to you. She wrote to you. <laughs> okay, let me ask you a question. I'll put you on the spot. Did you, did you read those letters more than once? Yes. Why? Because you loved her. See? <laughs> I really put him on the spot, right? The Bible is God's love letter to us. I don't read it because I'm trying to comply with some rule. But because I love him. Since we have received mercy, which is not receiving what we deserve, and grace, which is receiving what we actually do not deserve, out of humility and gratitude, I can wake up each morning... <laughs> I can wake up each morning knowing that because of His grace and love I received this incredible wonderful new relationship with God. And I didn't deserve any of it. I, didn't. I was forgiven and made a child of God, made a saint, made righteous, made holy. You know it's interesting today. I see it advertised all the time in the newspaper. This new ancestral thing where you go back and look at your ancestors. You've seen the commercial where the fellow who thought he was from Germany in the background and he had his German clothes. And then he found he was from Scotland and he changed it to a, yeah. a Scottish clothes. One lady writes in and she said, I, I looked back at my history and I found out that there was a woman way, way back who, who had a whole tribe of people and she was kind of the head person leading an army of women. She said, now I know where I come from. I mean, that's what she says on that in the commercial. Tell me, you, you wake up in the morning and know that you have the DNA of your Father in Heaven. Why do you need to know all that? There's nothing wrong with knowing that. But that's not what focuses my life. And if a guy who thought he was German background and went Scottish background changes clothes. Don't you think if we have the DNA of our Father, there ought to be some changes in our lives? In the way we live, in the way we talk, in the way we act? That's visible faith. That's visible faith. So I live out of a new relationship in the most practical of ways. I don't have to pretend or hide or wear a mask. I am loved by the God of the universe and he has done so much to prove himself trustworthy so that I can confidently and genuinely with all my being trust him. And do you understand? Do you understand? That's what he wanted all along. Do you understand that? Please somebody say it. <laughs> That's what he wanted all along. Yeah. Simple trust. Especially when I'm going through tough things. But it's all we sang about today. See, I said it just a minute ago. Please hear it. Until I trust Him, I cannot receive His love. No matter how much He loves me. Without Him, I can't. Do anything. I can drive a car, I can brush my teeth, I can do a lot of stuff. But nothing that has eternal significance Amen. until I trust Him. Because when I receive that, then I can really begin to receive His love and to share it with everybody else. And by the way, that's the abundant life that Jesus wants us to experience. he promised and the freedom to no longer be bound by past shame or oppression.
present addictions or anything. Because in Christ, I have everything I need.